Um, okay, so welcome everyone to the um, Asenity Fundicide launch event from Syngenta in partnership with uh, ICL. Uh, my name is Henry Bechelet. I'm the technical manager for ICL and I'm going to be hosting the event today. Um, and of course, it's a big day, isn't it? Um, I, I've been in my current role with um, as technical manager with ICL for eight years now and, and during that time, uh, I've only ever had one other fungicide launch. And so um, today is a big day for Turf Matters. Um, you, you know, it's really important that we have these um, new technologies sort of become available to us for use in our maintenance programs when we're looking to sort of maintain and improve the condition and the quality of turf. Um, and especially with you guys, you know, sort of having to sort of hit those really high standards under increasingly difficult challenges um uh you know it might be fixture list congestion congestion multi-use maybe um but sort of climatic challenges as well seem to be more and more sort of an issue and so sort of to have new fungicide technologies become available to us is, is going to be really important if we're looking to maintain those standards and i think so, sort of to start off i just sort of like to say you know how lucky we are to have syngenta batting on our behalf and and committing to the turf grass market and bringing through these new products for us because um you know it's hard enough without sort of having these new technologies coming through okay so let's just have a look at the uh at the the um agenda for today and um you can see there that um we've got three primary speakers going on we've got um Dan Lightfoot, who's going to talk about the R&D effort that's gone into bringing a Cernity to market and the challenges that are faced, especially the regulatory challenges that are faced, um, sort of bringing things through for you. The second speakers will be Glenn Kirby from Syngenta, who's going to talk about the product itself. He's going to um, tell you how a Cernity works, what diseases that it's... Um, effective against and how to to use the product properly and then finally we've got an extra special speaker um dr mike agnew is is currently over there in philadelphia uh, mike's just had his breakfast uh and mike is going to talk um about his experiences with the product because they've had uh, a certainty for a number of years now and uh, but also he's going to talk about some newer diseases that might sort of um come onto our radar um, or, you know, as, kind of, as as we move on. I know that sort of there's been some emerging sort of diseases come through in recent years. Okay, but you know, first off, I, I kind of, you know, want to um, make sure that we sort of make this event interactive. Um, so you might not be familiar with, um, with how this kind of go-to um, webinar format works. So there's a couple of things that might help make it sort of better for you first of all you'll see on the right hand side of the screen you can bring in a menu and within that menu there's a questions sort of uh tab if you if you click on that uh, you'll see that you can type in um questions and you can decide who gets those questions you know whether you want to send them to the panelists or whether you don't mind them being to uh the whole of the audience and um, what I'll do is I'll keep monitoring those questions as they come in and I'll ask them for you. So the spotlight's not going to come on to you and um, all of a sudden I'm going to say, right, uh, so-and-so's got a question. I'll represent your questions to the uh, to the speakers if an opportunity comes during, during their presentation, but certainly after the presentation. And hopefully you'll get all the answers that you need. You know, the key objective for this event is that you understand the, the product and, and if you need to ask further questions, please feel free to do so. Um, and also there's another thing that you might want to play around with. Um, if, if we move on to the next slide, Glenn, then um, you can alter the view. You know, you can sort of see that what, what we have here is a split screen. You've got the slide presentation, but also you've got the picture of me currently. You can see the sort of bar that's sort of in between them, those three lines in the middle there. You can, you can kind of click on that and alter the size of each either by scrolling up and down so um, you might want to make this minimize the speakers um, 
or enlarge the, the, the presentation slides to make it sort of all sort of easy to understand. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll move on. That's, that's my job during this whole thing is to keep things moving. So the first speaker today is um, Daniel Lightfoot from Syngenta. Uh, Dan's there waiting for us. Uh, Dan is the business manager for Syngenta Professional Solutions with responsibilities for turf and landscape, horticulture and pest control. Before um, entering his current role six years ago, Dan actually came from the turf um industry it was a course manager very sort of high-end golf course um, but also spent time as a college lecturer sort of you know uh, in the education sector sort of lecturing on sort of turf maintenance so dan's going to talk about the research and development that's gone into the um the, that's gone into a certainty and so dan i'll hand over to you Ah, oh, thank you, Henry. I really appreciate that. Great introduction. And um, yeah, I'd just like to say first off, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for uh, attending. Um, we're really grateful that people have been able to spare the time. I know it's a really busy part of the season, and so you know, engaging with us on this is yeah, you know, we're really delighted. So thank you. As Henry said, I've been in Syngenta uh, a long time now, uh, six years, and probably since the day I started, we've been working on this and Syngenta has been working on it from even way further back. So we're absolutely delighted, as Henry said earlier, that we're able to launch a new fungicide. They are incredibly difficult to launch and get registered these days. And we're you know, over the moon to be able to bring this to you and also to bring it to you with sta you know, stadium use um, which will Glenn will talk a bit more in terms of the intricacies around that, but the, the area that we're going to launch it into in, initially is an area where, to be honest, I, I don't think any of us thought we'd even get a registration. So to be able to get it for a use that I think is going to be fantastic for the product and also fantastic support for, for you guys in, in this field, then uh, yeah, we're, we're really, really delighted. So um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what goes into getting the product ready for, for market. And then Glenn's gonna probably talk a little bit more about the, uh, the, the actual product. So I just wanted to give a bit of background if that's okay for the first start. So Glenn, if you just move the, to the first slide, that'd be great. I think looking back that Syngenta um, has been working on this product for an awful long time. Syngenta is uh, a global organization that invests one and a half billion roughly into R&D every year, developing new active ingredients for use in a variety of markets and fortunately, you know, a real investment for use in, in turf grass. We've got roughly 5,000 scientists across uh, the global operation um, based all over the world and also 200 you know, specifically devoted to formulation. And Glenn's gonna talk a little bit later about you know, how this product specifically formulation is of the really highest quality, which enables us to get the registration, but also as probably Mike and Glenn will talk about, really enhance the efficacy. Although there's a lot of R&D, you know, just to get one molecule, one new active ingredient to market is, you know, at a cost that's going up and up, is about 350 million pounds and or million dollars and that investment is huge and the amount of work and time and effort that it takes to bring these new products to market I, I don't think when I was working in turf as a lecturer or as a golf course manager or right back you know when I was an assistant I don't think you ever really understand what goes into it until you end up you know lucky enough to come and work for a company like Syngenta and see the amount of effort the amount of you know innovation the amount of time and then to to really bring these solutions to market so you know I'm so excited to be able to you know host this uh, presentation today so moving on to more of a product level um the Acernity turf specific formulation was first tested in 2011. So way even before I started in Syngenta in 2015, they, Rod and the team were, were all looking at this. So this has been an awful long time in the making and also to get a new molecule, which probably takes about 12 years. So you're pretty much nearly looking at, you know, 20 years ago 
this project was started and uh, culminating in, in something today, I, I think it's quite special. Thousands of active ingredients were looked at and, you know, lots in this specific area. And in the end, we have got a great new active ingredient that Glenn's going to talk about, benzabin diflupia, um, which is a struggle to say. And I don't expect any of you to be able to repeat that first off. I think me and Glenn have had about six months practice. So we call it salatinol. It is the uh, name that we use globally. It's easier to say, but also it is one that we can all recognise and identify with. At a product level, we've done so much trial work on this, um, and we're really delighted to show you some of that. Over 75 field trials were carried out in Europe for the development of the product, and that's probably not even the end. There's work going on now, there's work plans for the future, so we're really, really excited about the work that's been done, the work we're doing now, and also working with you guys in the field to see some work in the future. So we're excited about the launch, but we're even more excited about how successful it's going to be um, once you guys get to use it. Next slide. So it's a new active ingredient, um, probably one of the kind of real highlights for us. And with that comes a new product. So what Glenn's going to talk to you about is the, the product, the, what the label looks like and, uh, and, and, you know, kind of how that fits. But from us, the excitement around a new active ingredient, the opportunity for rotation, a new product is is just brilliant. And so, um, yeah, as Henry said, you know, we, these times don't come along very often. So we're really excited to talk to you today about that. And um, I've got one more slide and then I'll pass over to Glenn for uh, all, all of the interesting information. I just think, you know, looking at this, it's real breakthrough technology. It's uh, a great opportunity in the UK and a great opportunity to kind of launch it into an environment where I think it's going to have so many uses. So um, look, again, just to um, bring it all together, I really appreciate everybody sparing the time at, at what's a busy time of year and with a lot of challenges and what's been a really difficult year. So I hope you enjoy the presentation. I hope you can you know, see the uses for you and thank you very much for attending. All right, Dan, you, thanks for that introduction. Do you mind if I just quickly ask you a question? You know, if it takes like 15, 20 years to, de to develop a product for market, you know, you've got to be pretty good at predicting the future and because the goalposts can kind of change all the time. Can I just quickly ask you while we're here, you know, how you feel the sort of um, turf management is going to be in the next 15 years? You know, what's, this, what's, what's Syngenta focusing on for us? Uh, thanks, Henry. Yeah, I, I think... Fortunately, predicting the future isn't just my job, so uh, that, that's somebody else's as well. But I think it's going to see a massive change. I did a presentation yesterday, I think, talking about this, and we are going to see a real step change. I think for sure chemistry is going to be absolutely vital. We've seen the challenges where we've had chemicals being reduced from the market and all the challenges that um, our customers have felt. And so absolutely from Syngenta's point of view, core chemistry and the support and the reassurance that it brings to customers is absolutely vital. But I think we are also seeing that there is a clear strategy uh, drive towards more sustainable, more kind of uh, greener solutions. But we also want them with the same level of efficacy. So from Syngenta's point of view, I think very much working towards bringing more biological solutions to complement the chemical solutions in a more integrated technology and then looking at how they, they blend together. Um, I think that's definitely the case. Also, I think that there's a development also towards more digital technology, looking at how the digital technology can help predict better, help give better advice, help apply things better. So I think we've core chemistry still been important, a move towards biological solutions and then complemented with digital technology. I think that kind of mix is where we see that integrated solution going in the future. Fantastic. OK, let, let, brilliant. And I think there is a sort of good future ahead for us, isn't there? So thank you for that, Dan. Let's move on to our second speaker, who is uh, Glenn Kirby from Syngenta. Uh, and Glenn also came, um, hi Glenn, also came from a greenkeeping background before taking on the, his current role of uh, tech manager for Syngenta Professional Solutions. 
and although Glenn is a turf specialist, he does have sort of horticultural responsibilities as well. But the thing I really like about Glenn um, is, he, is that he brings his practical experiences um, um, to the fore, really, and which is very helpful because there's, there's sometimes quite a lot of high science associated with uh, uh, with product launches like this. And what we really want to know is kind of you know how you know how to use it. it practically um, and how to get the best out of the Syngenta technology. So Glenn is going to talk about Acernity now and how to get the best out of it. So Glenn, over to you. Thank you, Henry. Um, yes, indeed, I have been in the trenches with you guys and I do try and get my head around high science and act a bit like a translator and sit in the middle. So we're gonna do our best today to explain where we are with this new fungicide. Um, it is exciting. Um, it's taken a long time to get here, but doesn't matter what we talk about today. What you're trying to achieve has been the same for a long period of time. You're under a lot of pressure. You're trying to come up with very high quality turf surfaces. You, particularly a lot of the guys that are on the call today, you are in the limelight. Your pictures are on TV on a regular basis. Uh, there is a lot of high demand and expectation and um, the world is in a very friendly place when things go wrong so we're there to support and it's very exciting to bring something new to the market that's going to help you on that journey and um, not just products there to help you on the journey we're there as well i'm there dan's there we've got marcella doing the european technical role we're there so if you need help and you want support reach out but for the moment, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about our new fungicide. And um, the exciting thing here, we've got a new chemical class, a new mode of action for Syngenta. It's got something different. We've got a bit of rotation in our portfolio for you, which is great news because when we're looking at the chemistry for the future, we're looking down the line, it is essential we get the very best out of these products for as long as we can. So we want to avoid any resistance issues. So having something to rotate and think about that in your programs is really important. Now, the key to bringing actives to the market now is having a very low active loading in them. Um, the flip side of that is they've got to be incredibly effective and very potent. And we've got something here that is very powerful, but with really low active loading. And that is the key for the future, delivering these low levels of active and really delivering. So pound for pound, we've got an amazing product. And then the systemic movement and the stability in the leaf is phenomenal. Now, some of this comes from the formulation and how we deliver it to the leaf. Some of it comes from the systemic activity in there. And we're gonna look at some of that today too. Let's see if my slides are working. There we go. So what have we got here? It's all right. I've had a screenshot come up saying my computer is going to restart automatically. Let's snooze that. So if I disappear, that's what's happened. So what we've got here, we have got a dual active, two systemic active ingredients in here. We've got salatinol and we've got diphenaconazole. Now you'll be familiar with diphenaconazole from Instrata Elite. So part of the active ingredient in this new product that you already have in your armory in Instrata Elite. But the salatinol is what I'm really gonna focus on today because that's new, that's the really exciting bit. That's the bit that's delivering the new, the new rotation chemistry for you. And in salatinol, we have a pyrazole carbon oxide. That's how it works. It's an SDHI, that's its rotation group. Uh, it's got very balanced systemic movement. Now, we've got two systemic active ingredients in here. What is unusual about this label is, although they are two systemic active ingredients, CRD have claimed on the label has contact and systemic properties. Now, we know and we understand the activity of these two active ingredients. They are systemic, but they bind so strongly into that leaf wax that the CRD are claiming that they have contact properties as well. Now, we've previously really communicated the activity of products is very black and white. You have systemics and you have contacts and there's no in between which really isn't the case because all active ingredients will have some level of activity even the most contact type active ingredient will have some movement into the plant and even the most systemic type product that will have some contact activity as well so it's not a black and white it's a very much a gray scale what we have here is two systemic active ingredients have strong contact 
properties, as well as excellent systemic movement. So both of them bind really strongly into the leaf wax, and we've got some nice curative and early curative prevention qualities between the two actives. And we'll take a deeper look into some of that in a minute. So a little introduction to what we've got on the label. We have a dose rate of three litres a hectare. Myself and Dan wait a long time to get these labels. Um, it's not till the label arrives that we know exactly how we can use these. But we know now that we can use this. Three litres a hectare, that is our application. It will come in three litre pack sizes and we are limited to two applications a year. So you have two Acernity applications in your armory and we'll look at how that fits into your programmed approach later. Now this is an interesting bit. This is something that we've not experienced in the turf market before. It's a very different area of use label. We have enclosed professional sports turf where access to wild, by wildlife is extremely restricted. That's a bit different and I'll go through the parameters on that a little bit later and you'll have a quite clear cut in your mind, uh, image in your mind at the end of it, whether you can use it on your site and what areas of your site you can use. Um, for, it's a little bit different for distribution because they've got to go out and they've got to establish on each site what's going on. But for you, you can paint a pretty clear picture by the time we've got through this presentation. Active ingredients, we've got those two actives in there that I've already mentioned, salatinol and diphenoconazole. And formulation wise, it's a soluble liquid, so a slightly different formulation to we've experienced before as well. Uh, rate of active, this is what I was talking about earlier about the active ingredient loading in there. If we look at it from a liters per a grams per liter, which is what we look at most products in the UK, we've got 24 roughly grams per liter of salatinol and 79 grams a litre of diphenoconazole. Some people prefer to see those as a hectare loading, so that's 70 grams of salatinol a hectare and 235 grams a hectare of diphenoconazole. Now on the label, we have three diseases on there. We have fusarium, dollar spot and anthracnose. We'll look at the label later and we'll look at it in the structure of the rest of the Syngenta portfolio and see where you can use that. And also, I'm going to talk a little bit about how labels are granted, what data we have to provide and what's a label likely to look like in the future. Uh, it's a dual systemic, like I've mentioned, but there are some contact properties from the strong binding. And application wise, you can put it out through a pedestrian controlled sprayer or on a vehicle mounted sprayer. The interesting bit that we have on the label at the moment is it is LRAP Freestar rated nozzles only. Now, some of you will be familiar with the LRAP Freestar nozzle um, when you're trying to adjust buffer zones around water. Um, this has a restriction on it where all applications should be made with Freestar LRAP nozzle. There are a couple of kind of strange bits of text in the label that we're challenging with CRD and we'll keep you updated, but there. At the moment, it's a freestyle nozzle application. So to give you a summary of what we're going to look at, we're going to go into a bit on the biokinetics, how the product works and moves within the plant. We're going to look at the formulation, the formulation team. Um, for me, they're like tyres on a Formula One car, the formulation team. It's about taking the active ingredient and delivering it to the plant. How do we get the very best out of it? And some interesting stuff there. Then we're going to have a look at once you've got it, what is it that you can do at your end to get more out of it, to get the very best out of this product in the field. We'll have a look at the spectrum of activity. Uh, we're going to kind of draw through a little bit of American data um, to compare that to what we've got over here so you can understand the breadth of the product. Then we're going to look at where it fits into a program. We're going to look at some of the trial data we've got. We've got a lot of trial data on this. A lot of it is on golf courses and Microdokium. Um, like Dan mentioned earlier, I think when this project started, we didn't expect that football would be the main place we were going to get it. Um, as things have panned out, we've ended up with a slightly different label to we were expecting and we get to concentrate on you guys a little bit, which is fantastic news. Then we're going to look at turf safety and compatibility. Really important. I can tell you, it doesn't matter how good a product is. If you're not confident that it's safe, then you're going to be hesitant when using it. Then we're going to look at exactly what that label means and then we're going to wrap up for conclusion and questions. So let's get going on today's Eternity journey. 
How does it act? Biokinetics. Well, biokinetics is a phrase that I was not familiar with before I joined Syngenta. And you're probably not familiar with at all until now. Biokinetics is all about the movement of those active ingredients. So when we've traditionally used the phrase contact and systemic, I thought I knew what that meant. Biokinetics is a whole study of how that moves into the plant, how it moves up the plant, down the plant, where it impacts, the speed it moves. It's a massive, fascinating subject. I'm going to give you a little introduction today, how it relates to salatinol particularly. So the strengths of salatinol are we have this fantastic photostability and non-volatilization. It's a very stable product. So when it hits the leaf, binds into that leaf wax, it hangs around for a good period of time. It's strong under UV light and it hangs around for a good period of time. We've got excellent balanced systemic movement. So the speed this regenerates and moves itself through the plant is very balanced. It's not too quick, it's not too slow. And we'll touch on why that's important soon. Excellent binding and activity in the leaf wax. That's critical. Um, we want as strong a barrier on the outside of that plant as we can possibly get so that when the pathogen gets on there when the infection is about that first line of defense is there and it's strong and that's really good in this product and the formulation of it helps move that around particularly well too and the stability and longevity within the leaf is very good too so how does it move what are the basics of this well it is leaf and crown absorbed so it's taken upward from the leaf and the crown upward through the plant and delivered um, just like contacts and systemics there is a very much a gray scale here it is less absorbed by roots some of it will be taken up by roots but primarily absorbed by the leaf and the crown it will then get moved into the plant where the systemic activity happens and it kind of re will replenish itself over time. That binding into the leaf wax and into the leaf acts as a nice reservoir to release this out through the plant. So why are these systemic properties so important? Why is systemic just simply not enough? Why do we need to understand more than that? Well, we've got a few things to think about when we're looking at systemics. We're looking to see how quick does that regenerate into new growth? So as that growth increases or decreases, as you get new stems growing, new leaf plant, new parts of the plant, it's important that that systemic activity will move into that new growth at an appropriate speed. But equally, we don't want it to move so fast that it all accumulates at the tip of the plant, because in this market, in this environment, in sports turf, we are constantly removing clippings. We are constantly taking the top of that plant off, physically removing it and taking it away. So if you have systemic activity that is too fast and accumulating at the tip, then we are in danger of reducing the longevity of that in the plant. So we've got these two things that we need to balance. We need to create a fresh protection for new growth, but equally we don't want to move it so fast that it disappears out of the plant quicker than we need it to. We got a really nice study here that we did at Jellets Hill that kind of explains some of that in a bit of science and hopefully I can make that clear for you. What we have here is a number of ryegrass pot trials. Um, these were all sprayed with a track sprayer. Now a track sprayer in this situation is a, simply a track up above here with a boom and some nozzles that would come along here and spray very much like you would in real life. So what we ended up with was this good coating over the leaf, very similar to you had in a real life sprayer situation at 250 litres a hectare in this trial. And what we then did is we took each leaf sample and we cut it down into sections. So we've got base, base to mid, mid to tip and tip. And we took those samples and we analysed them to see how the systemic activity, how the active ingredient was moving throughout this leaf, what was going on. So in this first set of graphs I've got here that I'm going to share with you, we have three days after application. So about 250 litres a hectare, three days after application. And what we can see is the salatinol element of that plant, of that active ingredient, was delivered nice and evenly across that whole plant. So it was delivered 
all the way across this plant. Now it's slightly less at the tip, but then the tip is a smaller target, so we would expect to see less accumulating there. That is more a reflection on the quality of the application than the product at this stage. But what we have done is we have delivered a strong leaf binding type um, product that has created a reservoir across this whole plant. And we see a very similar result over here with the diphenaconazole. We've delivered that across the leaf with the sprayer. So we've got this nice wide distribution. And what we're looking to do is keep that as even and as long as possible over time to keep delivering leaf all over leaf protection. So it was really nice to see at 10 days, 10 days after application, we saw this continued same pattern. We've seen very little movement across the whole thing. So that, that whole plant, it's grown, it's extended, but it's still cut into these four sections and we're still delivering that same level of active ingredient after 10 days. Now in a real life situation, what we're doing is we're constantly removing section one here. This is being mown on a regular basis and being physically removed. So in this situation, we're achieving exactly what we would hope. In real life, we are in a process of slowly removing that. And we're expecting all these applied areas from the crown up to continue to deliver fungicide over time. And that's what we're seeing in this chart. Same with the diphenaconazole over here. We've got this really nice equal delivery over the 10 days. And you can see in this kind of um, summary chart on that, the slight difference here, this isn't a percentage, this is how much active ingredient there was left in each sample. And on day one, you can see the slight downturn from base to tip, which shows good application. By day 10, it's redistributed itself nicely across. So we've got this nice gentle movement up to the higher parts of the plant without over delivering and it all congregating at the top for physical removal. And we see a very similar pattern with the diphenaconazole. This matched movement, these two systemic paired very nicely together, are what gives this the longevity. So now we've had a little look at how that's moving in the plant. What I wanna to touch on now is the activity of the disease and the optimum times to be applying things to get the very best out of them. And what I've got here, it's a bit of fancy graphics that shows the basic life cycle of disease. Um, you will have seen this in all sorts of different formats. I learned it on my MVQ2 25 years ago or whenever I did it. But the basic disease life cycle is pretty simple. We end up with a spore on the outside of that leaf that is sat there waiting for suitable conditions to grow, the right level of humidity, the right level of temperature, and it's looking for somewhere to go. And at this stage, when we've got this activity sat on the outside of the leaf, we've got a very healthy looking piece of turf. You, you wouldn't know. We move that on to the next stage where we start to see a little bit of penetration into the leaf. The temperatures are right, the humidity is right, and it's sending out these high fever that's going to start feeding down and looking for a way into the leaf. Again, turf-wise, we won't see any damage at that stage. This is right at the beginning of that life cycle. Um, and what we're looking to do when we're dealing with uh, fungicide and looking to get good control of disease, we are looking to get as early in this life cycle as possible. Whilst these disease populations are low, we don't want it to get into this endless cycle of recycling itself and increasing. We want to keep that population low. The next stage is when it really starts taking hold in the plant. Once we start seeing this mass production inside the plant where it's starting to destroy it from inside out. It's a pathogen that lives on the host, destroys the host, and then looks to move on somewhere else to attack that. And whilst you've got this going on, this is when you begin to start seeing some plant stress. Not a lot, probably still not noticeable. It's not until we get to that next stage where it starts exploding out of the plant and causing some physical symptoms. Now this isn't ryegrass, it's not stadium environment, but these very early stages of disease, this is when you're getting into this stage. Again, this is rust, so it's not, but it's a really nice visual impact of what I'm talking about here. Once we start seeing this, this is the pathogen starting to regenerate itself to kick out and look to create more spores and start this cycle again. 
And once we get into that stage, we're then recycling the whole process. It's moving around, it's exploding, and we start moving into exponential growth. We start moving into that disease population expanding. So when we're looking at this product and we're looking for application, we still stand by our core message, which is preventative and early curative applications are the absolute best method to keep control of disease. Waiting till you see visible symptoms is always going to present a much bigger challenge for any fungicide to get control of. And if we look at these same images again, so we're, what we're looking at here is this prevention stage where we've got the fungus on the leaf on the outside. This is where the salatinol element of that product of acernity really comes into its own. It's really effective at binding into this leaf wax, having contact activity on the outside and doing a really strong job for you on the outside of the leaf. When we move into this prevention strategy, so the plant is now under attack, there is something going on inside the plant. If we look at where this product is effective, we have the salatinol element doing a job for you here, and we've also got the diphenoconazole that's kicked in. So we've got this double protection against disease impacting inside of that plant. So you still can't see this, this isn't visible, but this is where this product is absolutely at its strongest. Once we move into this next stage and it's really kicking off and everything's ramping up inside that plant, um, then we move into the diphenoconazole that's having a really big impact for you here. The diphenoconazole is doing a job on the inside of the plant and it's helping really control things on the inside. Then we move into this kind of blistering stage, it's a radicant. Once things are kicking off and you've got visual symptoms, this is when things get hard because this is when things are going to start multiplying, growing exponentially. But we're still confident here, the diphenoconazole element of this is very strong in this period. Always better to be getting it at this early phase, but remember, the early phase is always now. As in, once that disease is visible, yes, you might have been better going two or three days earlier, but if you get on there now, you're slowing that process down even further. So key message here is go early. And we've got these two very nicely paired active ingredients in salatinol and diphenoconazole that will do a really good job for you throughout the range of disease attack periods, but it's always gonna be more effective earlier. And when we're looking at this, it's important to kind of think about this and um, where it fits amongst Instrata Elite now, because we've got the diphenoconazole that is in both products, but we've got salatinol, which is a systemic. So it's a kind of, you bring that in before the Instrata Elite because it's better in active growth. Whereas the Instrata Elite has the diphenoconazole and fludioxanil, which is the product in Medallion, which is a much more later, cooler contact period. So when you're looking at this and you're thinking about where do the two fit into your program, you want to be looking at Cernity um, first and then Instrata Elite later on in your program. And there's a nice image of where we've got really good control all across the board, but you're always going to be more effective being in at this earlier phase of disease. So formulation, let's take a look at that. We've got some really good biokinetic properties. We've got some really strong um, defense mechanisms in the product. Now we want to look at how has the Syngenta team taken this low level of active ingredient loading and how are we really delivering it to that plant in order to get the very best out of it. The first thing comes from this excellent droplet retention. The formulation in this product is excellent and in order to get the best out of these really low loadings we need to get great coverage and the adjuvants, the way this product has been developed gives us really strong droplet retention and then from that, we get this brilliant binding into the leaf wax. So spreading it as evenly as we can, catching as much of it on the leaf, and then letting it bind into the leaf wax is the way that we get the most out of this. Now, what I've got here is a microscopic image for you. Um, over on this side of the screen, we've got an old school Chipco. Um, now, forgive us for using products that are no longer registered, but you'll, you'll understand, I hope, when you know the length of the journey, first, first turf formulation of the Cernity was 2011, Chipco was the strong product on the market then that we were comparing it to. So there will be references throughout this, uh, try, um, throughout this presentation back to that. 
Now, if we go back to that period of history and that kind of fungicide, what we had was this high level of loading. There was around five kilograms of active ingredient in Chipco. And we could get away with, or you could get away with a much poorer formulation of product with these large kind of irregularly milled active ingredient granules that were very globular and bound to different parts of the plant in different concentrations. But when you were delivering huge amounts of active ingredients to the plant, you could get away with that. Whereas if we look at a Cernity, very same microscopic level image, you can see the quality of the milling and the level of spread we get over the leaf now. And this is the kind of formulation we need to deliver really low quantities of active ingredient and still come up with excellent results. And what that means for you in the field is we have a much wider range level of success. So this is a really good example of that. What I've got here is a trial that shows microdochium. And so we were hitting around 23% in the untreated controls. Now that's a very high level of disease and we've seen good control across a wide range of water volumes. Now that is a kind of nod towards how good the formulation in here, but we're delivering the same re results at 125 litres a hectare all the way up to 750 litres a hectare in this trial. So we've seen a wide range of high quality results due to that formulation across a wide range of water volumes. And it also, it's a kind of Syngenta staple, but um, pH levels, we are seeing great results from a wide range in pHs from five to nine. Um, it's very stable in hard water. And the formulation of this means that no additional water required, water conditioner is required. So there's no need for additional buffers, there's no need for anything like that. When the Syngenta bottle comes, it's been formulated to work in a wide range of water conditions and wide range of water volumes. So with all that in mind, how do you take this product and how do you deliver it in your situation to get the very best out of it? Well, let's look at the recommendations. Let's look at what the label allows us to do and what we are uh, advising. So early preventative to early curative is the key to all disease management. It's not that this won't work outside of those windows. It's that you will get better effects if you go early and you catch things early. The, the, the hurdles it has to overcome with lower disease populations are less, so you'll get more out of it. You have three litres a hectare is the product rate. And the label allows you to apply between 125 to 500 litres a hectare of water. Now, we would recommend that you set your sprayer up to get between 200 to 400 litres a hectare for your water volume. Um, that has a few hurdles because CRD have put a LRAP freestyle nozzle rating on this. Um, like I mentioned earlier, that's not just for adjusting around water courses, that is for all applications. We have questioned this and we are waiting on a response and we will update you, but as far as things go at the moment, you need to apply through a LRAP freestyle rated nozzle. Optimum timing for this product is active growth. It's as simple as that. Now, you need to look at your environment and think, what is active growth? You could be in a cricket pitch environment where you're outside in all the elements and you're on heavy clay and temperature is cool and your growth drops off early. Or you could be in a football stadium environment with very high end with under soil heating, lights, and you're keeping active growing, active growth going all the way through the season. There isn't really a period of the year you can pin on this. It's active growth. You've got two systemics, strong systemic activity that we want to be making the very most of. So active growth will enable that to happen. From a resistance management point of view, this is really important now. You're seeing less products, but hopefully the products we've got are going to be around for a long time. So you need to make the most of them. So lazy turf management of applying the same product back to back, back to back, back to back is going to see longer term failure or less efficacy out of those. Now, when you're thinking about sanity and thinking about that in your program, um, at application of two sequential Cernity applications in a row is the maximum you're allowed according to the label. We would always advise breaking them up, um, but you've got those two applications available. So we shouldn't see too many resistance issues. 
assuming everyone is staying within the label and using it properly. Now, SDHIs, there is one other SDHI on the market that shouldn't contribute no more than one third of the total applications in your season. So have a little look at your program. This is where we need to think about programs in the round. One third of those should be SDHIs or no more than one third. Now, from an application point of view, if you do have water courses, and that's unlikely with the label we've got, but if you do have any water courses that run through the environment you're applying in, six metres is the minute is the buffer zone, and there's no negotiating on that. It's six metres. That's all you can do. You cannot adjust that. So we're going to go a little bit into three-star rated nozzles and what they are. Now, you have to have a three-star rated nozzle as the label stands at the moment when you're applying this. There are a mass of those out there. Um, if you want some guidance, go onto the health and safety website, have a little look and see what's there, but there's 10 pages of them. And why is there a LERAP three star rated nozzle on there? Well, it's nothing to do with the product. This is a big drive by CRD to eliminate drift. And you're seeing it across agriculture, you're seeing it everywhere. They're finding, um, they're finding active ingredient, this in non-target crops, so they're really going to try and eliminate how much drift there is. Now, in order to eliminate drift, you probably need larger droplets, lower pressure. And that's what LERAP nozzles are all about. And nozzle technology has got a journey to go on to catch up. We as an industry have got to do some work looking at how we apply these products because CRD are going to start putting these kind of restrictions in. Now, we've been aware of this for a little while. We've been working on a project to develop a new set of nozzles that are very, very drift uh, reducing, um, minimal drift. That technology isn't quite there yet, but what we would recommend you do now is you look to set your sprayer up in that 200 to 400 litres a hectare, find some LERAP freestyle nozzles on there, and stick with the recommendation for those freestyle nozzles. Just keep an eye on what you're doing. Um, we do need to pay more attention to how we apply these things. We've been working on that communication a little while and we'll continue to do it. But 200 to 400 litres a hectare through a LERAP freestyle rated nozzle. Rainfastness, this is an important one. Um, some of our products, when we do trials on rainfastness, we see a very clear cut. If you apply now and it doesn't rain, you'll see a really strong result. But if it rains within half an hour, you'll see that effectiveness drop off quite quickly. We don't see that with Acernity. What we see with Acernity is the longer it is dry on the leaf, the more effective it is. So even if you have rainfall straight afterwards, you will see some effectiveness. But the longer you can allow it to dry on the leaf, the more effective it becomes. So we are recommending two hours as a minimum but the longer you can let it dry on that leaf the more effective it is and we've got a nice study that shows this that after 15 minutes of rain we lost some efficacy but the longer it was allowed so once we were up at kind of two hours we were seeing really good longevity so key message here let it dry as long as you possibly can on that leaf it will still work if you get some rainfall afterwards it just won't be as effective so that's irrigation rainfall let it dry on that leaf so now I want to take a look at the spectrum of activity. Um, what we have in the UK now is a rigorous process for testing these products, making sure they're safe, making sure they're effective and they do everything they need to do. There is a lot of data that Syngenta need to submit to CRD to back all these claims up. And we do that and we're happy to do that. The more data we want though, and the more data they need, the longer this process gets and the longer it takes to get these products to market. So we are taking a very pragmatic view now to bring products to market with label claims that are enough to get it registered and out there. Now, we're very confident in its broad range of activity, but gathering all the data to get all of those label claims is a huge amount of work. And you'll start to see products come to the market that have label claims, and then those label claims over time increase as we gather more and more data to support it in the UK. Well, what we can always do is look to the states to see what's been done over there already. And that will give us an indication of how broad a spectrum the fungicide is that we're bringing to market. And what we have here is a table that shows you the ratings for um, acernity in the states. And we've got three star activity on a wide range of diseases here. 
uh, free star activity is the highest level of activity you can get, I believe, and I'm sure Mike will support me or correct me on that one. And we've seen high levels of activity on brown patch, white ear patch, grey leaf spot, slightly less on standard leaf spot, but we still expect to get moderate control on that in the UK. We are doing some trial work at the moment. We are building the submission dossier to support leaf spot on the label. And as that goes on, we'll keep people updated on the results of those trials and we will get that added to the label as soon as we can. Uh, but we also see good results on grey snow mold, good results on red thread, fairy ring and take all. I'm sure Mike's going to expand on some of this in his presentation later. But what we see with this product is a very broad spectrum fungicide. It covers a lot of disease. It's very effective. That doesn't necessarily reflect in the label that we're going to show you in a bit. And it's also very active in the soil. So whilst I mentioned earlier that it's not particularly root uptaken, it's very effective in these soil-borne diseases, in fairy ring and tapeworm. And I have a little look at some user trials we've got there. It's not these aren't on the label at the moment, so you can't do it this yet. But should you have some fairy ring challenges or some take all challenges, we are confident that with time we'll be adding those to the label and the activity is very strong in those. Um, I've got a quick graph here that um, shows the level of control we've got on standard leaf spot. These are from a 2012 trial and I'm looking forward to seeing what Mike has to say about this later. And here's some grey leaf spot as well and we've seen excellent control of grey leaf spot. Now, this is a useful one because we've seen a little bit of grey leaf spot popping up in the UK, not much of it, but it's a worry. Um, so knowing that there is a product in our armory that could give us good levels of control of that if it becomes a challenge is good to know. So now is the important bit. We really need to think about where you fit this into your program. How can you use this to get the very best out of it? And I often get asked a lot when I'm talking to people about products, what should I use for this disease or what should I use at that time? And it's really difficult to think about products as individual bits. They're building blocks or part of a program. And what we have here and something really good is a, a new mode of action for the Syngenta portfolio. So we've got this SDHI now, which is a really good piece of rotation chemistry. We've got some very strong products that are systemic for the beginning of the year, but we need to manage and rotate those with other products in order to get the very best out of them. And that's what we now have. Um, what I've done is I've pieced all of the Syngenta portfolio into this table and I've put all of the label claims. Now, these are the label claims that CRD have granted. So these are where you can officially use it and where we have supported this with data. Now, you can see the products that have been with us a very long time. You can see the heritage products are showing large levels of control across the board. In Strata Elite is just like I was talking about, the pragmatic label that we're looking to add to, and we've recently added Red Fred to the Instrata Elite label, and we'll continue to add as we get the data. And then we've got Medallion, which offers really good control on Microdokium and some good useful levels on leaf spot. Now, if you want to understand this process, you would look at this table and think that Acernity is the weakest product in the portfolio. And that's really not the case. What we have here is a product that we're very confident on, on a wide range of diseases. It's very effective, but it's worth explaining why we've got these. Now, we expected to see something along reduction, moderate control, useful levels for anthracnose and dog spot. And that's purely down to a lack of data. We submitted some data and some trials when we were applying for this label, but we knew that we were tight on whether we had enough data to give ourselves a full level of control. And we were really confident in the results, but we just knew that we were submitting close to what was an acceptable level of data for CRD to grant that. So we were expecting reduction or some wording along those lines. What we weren't expecting was moderate control on microdokium. Um, that really surprised us and we've gone back and we've challenged why and we want to understand exactly how they come to that conclusion. 
because we submitted a very thorough portfolio and we're going to have a little look at that so when we put a label um, submission together when we ask for these things we have to submit something called a biological assessment dossier so we have to submit a number of trials and in there we have to have untreated controls and then we also have to have other products that are in the market that are deemed the standard and, and we then have to compare it to in these set of study, studies we submitted 17 trials um, with a standard of chipco of old school chipco which is deemed to be the gold standard product and averaged out over the whole period of those trials we achieved greater levels of control than we did with chipco now when you're looking at these two graphs and the level of control this is what we see in our trials when you start with a mean disease application of three percent that's a decent amount of disease to start with so these are treated as curative trials um, you don't see the levels of control that you would expect even for if old school technology now that is why we encourage people to go early because you then get much higher levels of control than you do if you wait so 17 trials we outperform chipco in that situation we were expecting to be granted full control another four trials against microdochium here and um, when we submitted this dossier and they were with instrata as the standard this is old school instrata nine liters a hectare and we saw the same level of control with as we did with instrata so we we're very confident in, a pro in it as a product because it's performed as well as the gold standard products that we've had in the past. So when we start piecing that data together and we start looking at what tools you now have to build your programs, these are the products that we can offer you. This is the Syngenta portfolio. So we have a number of QOLs down here. We've got Heritage, which is the water soluble granule. We've got Heritage Max, that formulation. And then we've got FR321, which some of you will be familiar with. FR321 is a box set that we do. It is all packaged up. So you have um, 300 grams of heritage in there you have two liters of medallion in there and you have one liter of rider so it's a really nice box set um it tank mixes very nicely the downside in the markets in areas that you're looking at is there's rider in there so we need to think very carefully about how we place that in our program but by piecing these together we can get a very strong program now you can take four of these from this box and um, that's for a resistance management point of view you're allowed four out of here and they can make up one third of your program you then have two acernities now available to you you have two instructor elites and four medallions now taking all of those tools um the obvious question is how do i build a program and that is almost impossible for me to answer in this platform I'm more than happy to talk to people individually and talk through their challenges and their situations but what i can do is kind of give you a guideline a rule a kind of a way to piece these together to understand how they fit and what you can do to build a program this isn't a program recommendation this is a structure to show where they fit now i would always start with heritage you've got the systemic activity of, of heritage but very broad levels of control it's a great place to start particularly around renovation periods and that early season early disease season i would then look to a certainty very similar kind of activity we've got dual systemic in there we've got this strong contact kind of binding into the leaf wax but most importantly, we've got this rotation. So we're taking heritage and then we're using rotation chemistry to kind of break the resistance issues with a certainty. And then go into something like FR321, where we've got this high loading of three or two thirds heritage, two thirds medallion. And if you use that in that earlier part of the season before you've got lots of play going on on that pitch where kit transfer could be an issue with the rider or, so when you're applying it to a dry leaf and it's got a chance to dry that's when that fr321 really comes into its own at the beginning of that program you can then move into a sanity again that dual systemic activity means as we start moving into slightly cooler periods we're still getting really strong effectiveness out of it then you've probably got time for one more heritage this is all going to depend on how your season is going and what climate you're in and whether you've got additional lighting or under soil heating 
Then as we start moving into the cooler periods, the temperatures start dropping off, as growth starts to become a bit more hit and miss, we move into its structure elite territory. We then get into some rotation again, where you can start bridging that all together with medallion, it's strata relief. And then at your coolest period of the season, medallion is your go-to product. So it's not a program. This isn't a recommendation I would make. It's a structure to start building your program. And you can't look to any one of these to do a specific job. You've got to think about that, how will they all piece together to do something for you. So having gone through all of that, what I'd now like to do is take you on a little tour of some of the disease control data we've got. We have a huge amount of data on this. We've done a lot of trial work. Uh, like Dan pointed out, over 75 trials. And I'm gonna take you on a, a guided tour of a few of them. Now, a lot of the trial work we've got is in a golf green situation. That was the market that we thought this product was gonna be very big in. Um, the label restrictions that we've had put on it have meant that it's going to be primarily marketed into this different stadium environment. Um, so some of the trials I'm going to show you aren't particularly relevant, but they are very strong and they show you just how effective the products are. So if we go on a little trip to Dublin, over to Ireland, to the Irish Sports Turf Research Institute, Dublin is one of the highest pressure um, microdocum areas of the country that I've had the pleasure to visit. And what we did here is we looked at some integrated programs. So we have a trial 2018 where we use a CERNity. Uh, a month later, we went into an Instrata Elite and then we went into a medallion application. And you see, we started back end of September and the second application went on back end of October, and then the third application went on back end of November. And what you can see here is we had this real big spike of disease at the back end of the year. This is the untreated control I'm highlighting here. But by using this really strong program at the beginning, so we went in preventatively, it was an early preventative program starting early at low levels of disease, we saw this really high level of control. And the pleasing thing in this, by going with a high level High quality product early in a preventative manner gave us this phenomenal longevity at the back end. If you look at the disease spike we were seeing through December, yet yeah, no additional applications after that medallion and we kept a very flat line for disease until we started moving into spring and it started moving again. It was really positive. And some nice images here of the level of control we could achieve in that situation. Very, very confident in it, in its position uh what can i look at next so one of the biological assessment dossier trials that we put together was this one and this was put together and submitted and it's one of the ones that will be included in those 17 that you saw in that graph this was at a golf club again and what we saw in this situation was up against chipco um now you can see one application in this situation of certainty against two applications of chipco and we saw decent level of disease in here. We were hitting around 15% and we saw very high levels of control. Um, now we saw good levels of control through here. The longevity on this was very strong here and I would suggest that it's not realistic in most situations, but in this winter, the way this broke for us, we saw really long levels of control. Very exciting. Now, the two red ones here are both user trials. Um, there are some user trials that we did with looking at Fairy Ring. So I'm gonna go on this one. So this is Royal Liverpool. If it's gonna move for me, come on. There we go. So we went to Royal Liverpool Golf Club and we did some user trials on Fairy Ring. Now, I've taken a customer statement here. It's very different, difficult in user trials to pull any data out of them, but what we do get is some really nice statements. And there's some key things here. So we started doing trials in 2017. The course manager was really keen to take that through to 2018. So there's the first sign. If the course manager wants you back to do another user trial, you know he's seeing some results. Really keen to use the material again. So very engaged, wanting to use that. That is a strong sign in a user trial. If they don't see any results in year one, you don't get asked back to year two. The next thing to take out of his statement is that he had a number of other measures in place. Now, fairy ring is a tricky disease to manage um, and 
it is a multiple strategy to deal with it and Acernity will play a part in the future in people's fairy rings programs but there are other measures that need to be put into that and he felt that Acernity contributed towards the success not relying on that fungicide to do all the work itself but he has to put a strategy together and he felt that Acernity was really important in that now the big thing that he saw was a perceived residual activity into following years so when you apply any product for fairy ring if that fairy ring has kicked off and it is moving you are going to see the visual symptoms of that for a decent period of time and what we're seeing more and more is when we're putting programs together for fairy ring you are seeing the results the following year so you're not seeing these really instant results of knocking it down zeroing it out you are seeing a long-term impact and it's about putting a strategy and a program together for fairy ring but Acernity can play a very big role in that um, he would definitely use it as part of his integrated program against fairy rings in the future and that was really pleasing and as much as we can ask for we got an image here that he sent me um, nice wiggly line down the middle and we've got a treated area on the left hand side and then an untreated on the right hand side and you can see the short term visual impacts of that but you are still seeing some fairy ring there and there's a long term strategy there to dealing with that for the future um, this is typical of what he was experiencing in year one and he believed he was moving it forward as part of the strategy um, fairy ring I'm really interested to see if Mike's got anything to say about this and the he's use in there. Um, we'll be working really hard to get it on the label in the future. Um, but it's a good one. Right, turf safety and compatibility. It's all very well at doing a really good job for you. It's all very well being really formulated, but you need to know that it's super safe and it's not gonna impact anything negatively. Number one, formulation as always with Syngenta is top notch and you will have no issues going through the spray it's passed all our residue and foaming tests and it's excellent from that point of view compatibility wise we don't recommend any tank mixing with this um however on the compatibility testing we've done in a wide range of soft and hard waters we've seen no negative impact with tank mixing it with any other product so you can be really confident if you were to do something although we always recommend doing a jug test but we have seen no downside to tank mixing it compatibility wise physical compatibility methods. from a safety point of view uh, over 75 trials in nine different countries a wide range of climates different times of year spring summer autumn winter a wide range of grass species we have never seen any phytotoxicity ever recorded anywhere and in a high percentage of those we would have doubled the application rate to test that too and we've never seen anything at high rates either so you can be really confident that this is a very safe product and won't do any harm to the crop you're applying it to we've also done a lot of trial work on it at seeding and that early phases and this graph on rye grass shows you um, on day of seeding five days before seeding no downturn against the untreated control on ceiling turf which is great news for a lot of you in that renovation situation to be very confident on it in that early phase we're getting close to the end now and hopefully you're all out there thinking how can i fit this into my program what can it do we need to get over that hurdle of where can it be used crd grant these labels and this label that they have granted us has this restriction on the label this area of use this is a new one for us so it's going to take a little bit of explaining and just going through so you can see whether the piece of turf you're managing fits into the criteria so on sports turf stadiums and intensively managed sports turf we delve into that a little deeper that is enclosed professional sports turf where access by wildlife is extremely restricted what does that mean? Well, it's all about these guys, lagomorphs. Lagomorph is a scientific name for a rabbit and hare. And what CRD are worried about is anything that has an exclusive diet on grass, on turf grass. So what they're doing, when they look at their models, when they look at everything and they're looking at this deeper and deeper, what they want to understand is if an animal takes its diet solely from an area that's treated will there be any harm caused this isn't a reflection on the product 
This is just a reflection on all products that are being looked at now. Now, as we're coming out of Europe, all of our registrations need to go through the UK registration office now, and they are looking at things, even though it's the same legislation, they are looking at things through a slightly different lens to other countries around the world. So let's break that down a little bit. What does all that mean for you? So what does enclosed professional sports turf mean? Well, enclosed is where it's heavily restricted to wildlife and wildlife, particularly grass feeding wildlife can't get in. Professional sports turf means that anything that is managed in a professional way. So even if you're an amateur managing an amateur bowls pitch, bowls bowling green, that is still allowed if it is being managed professionally. Now that means you have someone basis registered, someone selling professional products coming in and advising. What this means is not lawn care, not b &Q, not eBay. This is professional sports turf that is being managed professionally. Restricted access to wildlife. So that means can rabbits and hares primarily get in there? Um, if they can't get in there then it's fine if they can get in there then i'm afraid in this situation you cannot use this product so what does wildlife mean that's quite a wide term does it mean foxes badgers birds no it refers to turf eating species primarily rabbits and hares so what we have to do to get this registered in a wider range is we need to do some studies to prove that they don't exclusively feed on treated areas um, and until we get that then it's only areas where it's restricted there's fencing in place so there's something going on that will stop those animals getting in there and that it's only turf eating species so deer not included foxes not included badgers not included birds not included they all get their diet from other places other than exclusively turf but not golf. So we've gone back to CRD and we've clarified this. Um, if there, even if a golf course had a fence around it that would stop rabbits getting in there, specifically asked for it not to be on golf until we do the studies. And there's some differences here um, between the way countries have looked at this label and way, the way they have done things. Um, but in the UK, it is not golf. It's areas where it's restricted to wildlife, but not golf. So why football in the UK? For those of you that kind of keep an eye or talk to colleagues in other parts of the country or other parts of Europe, you'll see that we have it in football and other places don't. Well, UK CRD take a very different um, approach to the way they model disease or they model these things and they take a different approach to drainage water in football to other countries and therefore we have got it in football. And why are we seeing this difference now? So what we've got is um, we used to have a mutual recognition system, or we still have a mutual recognition system, whereas all the time we were in Europe, we could register a product in Holland and then we could mutually recognize it into the UK, which is what's happened in Ireland recently. So then we would have achieved the same label that they would have granted in Holland. Whereas now we are falling outside of Europe, all of this will go through UK, so the UK will interpret that legislation in however they feel is appropriate. In this situation, they have granted it in football, but not in golf. So hopefully that summarises the product for you, gives you a pretty good idea of how to use it, uh, the diseases that it, we are really confident on it on, how safe it is, and you have got a pretty good picture now whether you can use it on your site. Um, from a conclusion point of view, as both Dan and Henry mentioned earlier, it's really exciting to be launching a fungicide. They don't come along very often. Uh, it's maybe not as wide a market as we hoped when we developed this product, but that will come. And at the moment, we get a chance to concentrate on you guys and make sure you're getting the very best out of it. So it's really exciting to be doing that. We've got two very strong mode of actions in there. We've got really good activity in organic matter. We've got a fantastically formulated product that we're very confident in. Great balanced systemic movement, strong stability in and on the leaf, and some nice kind of rotation chemistry in there. Um, really excited to get it in the market and um thank you for listening to me now if you need help setting your sprayers up for those lee wrap nozzles we do offer that in our greencast turf app
So that's probably worth having a look at if you've got any nozzle questions. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Good job. You can breathe now um, and and lie down, I would think, after that. So um, let's move on. Got to keep things moving. And we've got, um, as I mentioned earlier, a very special speaker at the end, uh, Dr. Mike Agnew. And he's got a very impressive. Hi, Mike. He's got a very impressive bio. But I'm going to read out because I think, it, you know, my career looks very, very Week compared to yours. Mike got his um, his PhD at Kansas State University all those years ago. I won't mention that, Mike. Um, well, thank you. Yes, in terms of his work experience, um, became an associate professor, uh, professor um, turf grass specialist at Iowa State University, and then sort of broadened his role into horticulture uh, towards sort of mid to late 90s. Um, went out in the industry to work for Super Geige and, and Novartis up to the sort of turn of the millennium, but has been in his current role um, for a number of years now as um, senior field technical manager for Syngenta Professional Solutions. Um, but most brilliantly, in um, 2018, Mike was um, given the sort of ginormous honour, really, of, of, of being awarded the New Jersey Turf Grass Hall of Fame Award. So obviously Mike's kind of, you know, got a, a long career in turf, but obviously he's worth listening to as well. And so Mike is going to talk about his experiences with the product because they've had it for a number of years and um, and also focus on some diseases that we might need to be mindful of in the future. So Mike, I'm going to hand over to you. Welcome and, um, and uh, looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. Well, thanks for having me, first off. And uh, Glenn, I want to tell you, I've uh, sat through a lot of Acernity presentations and you did a magnificent job in explaining the product uh, to it. Uh, I, I'm going to actually uh, suggest our uh, product manager reach out to you because you've done a super job. I was uh, asked last week, uh, a little short uh, interval of time to prepare a, pres a presentation on understanding gray leaf spot and brown patch. And I understand that uh, gray leaf spot has become a issue in the UK, at least in one site. So that's a very important uh, point to make is that uh, you've seen it once in one site, it doesn't mean it's gonna be an epidemic everywhere else, but you should be aware of what gray leaf spot is and how uh, it affects uh, uh, perennial ryegrass. So let's get into it. Uh, gray leaf spot, the pericularia grisia. Uh, it uh, really affects two cool season grasses. It's uh, perennial ryegrass and tall fescue. I've dealt with this uh, disease since the mid 90s. Uh, it wasn't really an issue in golf courses and and that's where we primarily see the issue and in lawns on tall fescue until that particular time. And it's a, it, it's really a interesting, we go back and say, why is that? Uh, a lot of it is because people started transitioning from perennial ryegrass, uh, from Kentucky bluegrass to perennial ryegrass because they were tired of battling diseases on Kentucky bluegrass. And then perennial ryegrass became a predominant species in the Mid-Atlantic region um, and also up into uh, New Jersey. And we saw an epidemic happen in the mid-90s that typically wiped out golf course fairways and roughs within days uh, going. And no one knew what the disease was because it was new to the area. And uh, everyone thought it was pythium. So they were spraying pythium products which, with no activity whatsoever. So it's, it's an, an important disease. And if you're growing perennial ryegrass, it's an extremely important disease and, and you need to understand what it is. In the United States, it occurs in the summer and the fall. And people think, oh, it's just a drought summer disease. But this disease can linger up to the first frost. And by that, I mean, it's just, it, can, it manifests itself into some really damaging situations. Conditions for favoring the disease, right here is the extended periods of heat and drought stress in late summer is what um, helps the disease manifest itself in the stand. 
development in perennial ryegrass can happen under colder weather, as I just said, and well into late fall. So when we do trials these days, we monitor those trials all the way to the first frost so that we can get a good, uh, good understanding of the pathogen. Whoops, I don't know what just happened. So, so let's go through some of the symptoms of the disease. Uh, as I understand it, one sports field had this, uh, uh, stadium had this issue in, in the London area. Um, and these enclosed arenas are probably perfect for the uh, symptoms to, or the disease to manifest because you have a really an environment that is is artificial and, and can be an impacted uh, by this disease. So when you look at, the, at this disease, it starts itself as uh, uh, gray lesions on the margin of the leaves, and then it goes into this uh, uh, symptom of the yellow halos on the uh, leaf itself. And oftentimes you're gonna see this twisting of the leaf tip as it turns brown. Numerous dark, uh, brown lesions will also appear up and down the leaves. So this, it's one that you need to identify early because if you identify it early, you may have a chance of controlling it from spreading throughout the, uh, the turf grass area. So in the early dawn, there you go, it's, the phone's ringing, don't know why. So, in the early dawn hours, leaves will have a purple appearance due to the production of a multi, multitude of spores. Uh, so as the spores uh, develop, it's a, it's a really a purple appearance. Under less severe conditions, turf will uh, appear thin and yellow, and you will see this thinning uh, happening. And the grasses that are left will be non-ryegrass species. And this happens to be a rough, in the uh, Maryland area where you can see the disease was taken out all the ryegrass leaving other species uh, unaffected. And it looks like a drought-like appearance. So the disease cycle, and this is important to understand the disease cycle. Pathogens survive adverse periods in dormant mycelium and infested leaves and plant debris. As mentioned earlier, a certainty actually has the capability of having activity on organic matter. So that's, that's a real positive when it comes to the control of this disease over time. Conditions conducive for the pathogen growth. Typically, you want uh, temperatures of 28 to 32 degrees centigrade and continuous leaf wetness for nine hours. Under cooler temperatures, where you have between 20 and 23 degrees centigrade, we've seen continuous leaf wetness of 21 to 36 hours manifesting this disease activity. Uh, canidia on the leaf are, are produced during high periods of uh, high relative humidity and uh, moist leaf surface. And so, simply said, you need to have continuous leaf wetness and the right condition temperature. So you need that part of the disease triangle, the right conditions. Alternating wet and dry cycles over time are ideal for this condition of the spores and new tissue. And, and I know that we've had summers where we had uh, drought, uh, excuse me, two years ago, we had a summer where it stopped, uh, started raining in June and didn't stop to the following May. And Gray Leaf Spot was probably one of the worst epidemics in recent history I've seen. Uh, in, in the eastern seaboard of the U.S., we saw a disease from uh, Virginia all the way up to Maine. So we're talking probably as far north as Manchester in, in the U.K., having some uh, pretty severe disease because of the, the, the conditions. So one of the things we want to do when managing this disease is to avoid practices that promote rapid leaf growth during infection periods that includes things like the, the this disease typically will increase with nitrogen rate so the more nitrogen you put on the turf 
the greater the potential for the disease to happen. We also know from trials and, and, and observations on golf courses that the higher the mown turf, the more susceptible the turf is to this disease. So we've uh, a lot of uh, what we do in trials is look for uh, areas where the, the area is mowed a little bit higher because we're going to get a better take on the disease when we try to get disease. The other factor is newly established turf is much more susceptible than mature stands. And I'll show you some data to point that out because I do research at Rutgers University every year in New Jersey and University of Maryland in, in, uh, in Maryland. And one is a, uh, a mature stand, the other is seeded every summer for the disease. And we'll get into that in a few minutes. We do a lot of trials. Uh, when this disease happened uh, in the mid 90s, Rutgers University through their extensive breeding program established cultivar trials for perennial ryegrass for susceptibility. And they're able to find different types of grasses that are able to maintain well, and you can see the uh, gray leaf spot all the way around this turf, uh, turf grass plot. But these cultivars in here, there are many that are, are uh, resistant to uh, gray leaf spots. So that's one of our uh, recommendations all the way at the bottom here is renovate damaged areas with cultivars that are known resistance to this disease. And going up to the top here, limit drought stress and extended periods of leaf wetness. So that's pretty difficult. Uh, sometimes you don't have control of the extended periods of leaf wetness, and sometimes you don't have control of the drought stress either. But water, the, the key is to water the turf thoroughly and as infrequent as possible to maintain good growing conditions and optimal water levels. As far as nitrogen goes, avoid that uh, uh, high nitrogen, uh, medium to high nitrogen during the midsummer when the uh, temperatures and humidity are optimal for disease development. So this, uh, this will help prevent the disease from taking hold, hold of lush turf grass. So I would also recommend using uh, uh, a slow release nitrogen source in midsummer. That helps keep that, that, uh, that progression of a, a release of nitrogen at a high level. So it's a great way to maintain it. When disease is active, mow the canopy when it's dry only and remove clippings. When you spread the clippings, you're gonna spread the disease. And if it's wet, you're gonna have a greater a potential of getting those spores into the mowers and moving it down. I've seen many examples of this on, on golf courses. You can see where they mow through wet areas. Uh, and into dry areas and spread the disease uh, into areas that shouldn't have had the disease. When the disease is active, avoid herbicides. It's a stress that's only going to promote the disease. And look at avoiding uh, plant growth regulators only when the disease is active. And I say that as an important factor is that if the leaf is not growing, it can't grow out of an infection. But what you wanna do is use growth regulators during non-infected periods, because that's gonna actually help retain the fungicides in the plants when you spray them in preparation for this disease. So as I looked at the uh, information that's in the UK and, 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 uh, and I tried to, look at what we have in the United States, I saw three active ingredients that have excellent activity on gravy spot. We use medallion, uh, we call it uh, SC in the United States, you call it TL. We use uh, heritage, uh, WDG and, and equivalent to your max formulation. And we also use an acernity. Cernity is relatively new to the gravy spot market, but in all the trials and all the uses that we've had, uh, I've never had a complaint on its uh, control. And in fact, I've had nothing but uh, positive responses. 
So the one thing you have to do in a disease control program, if you want to build one that controls gray leaf spot, as well as brown patch, as well as leaf spot, as well as other diseases on sports fields, for example, you want to make sure you use a, a, an appropriate systemic fungicide on a preventive basis. And I think uh, in the previous presentation, it was pointed out, you're going to get much better disease control if you're preventive. And I used to, when I was in extension years ago, I was under the mindset, we should actually be treating everything curatively because, gee, you, would, you would, may use less product, but when we started doing all the research back at Iowa State in, in 1980-something, uh, we actually realized that a preventative application is going to use much less uh, uh, product over a long period of time. Unfortunately, there's times where you need a curative control and tank mix, a, I like to tank mix an effective contact with a systemic fungicide and the certainty has that contact activity and it also has that systemic product within it. So both Difen and Salatinol are, are uh, systemic products and they both really are very slow moving up there. So I, up in the leaf, and it consistently moves in the leaves, and it makes a great product for uh, early curative. And um, remember that uh, infected turf uh, that uh, is uh, will also be more prone to inf uh, natural infections of other diseases like any of the rhizoctonias, brown patch. And remember that. Uh, when we talk about brown patch later, it's the same disease that actually affects cool season brown patch. It's uh, it, we we see that in uh, controlling all different types of brown uh, brown patch from whitea patch to brown patch to large patch and, and warm season grasses. I want to look at a couple of data points for each one. It was mentioned earlier that we started really looking at a certainty back in 2000 and, uh, and uh, 11. This is supposed to be 2013, by the way. So, no, actually, this is medallion. This is 2003. And we actually evaluated before we actually looked at Grayley Spot on what rate did we need for control of, of uh, Grayley Spot. And we found that we could reduce the amount of disease with the ultra low rate of, of uh, 381 grams per hectare of active ingredient, 70 some percent from uh, in a natural infestation. This is what the levels we were battling. This is in a mature uh, turf grass stand and looking at this type of disease. Obviously, if you increase the rate, you're going to get better control. And when you look at the rates that we have in the US, I meant to mention this is that you have three liters, that's equal to 375 uh, grams per hectare. Our low rate for a medallion is 398. But in our Instrada rate, we go all the way down to 200 grams uh, of medallion. So it's a very efficacious material. And for heritage, we typically run at uh, our low rate is 300 grams active ingredient. But we actually have label rates in combination products where it is, is only 150 grams, providing excellent control. And essentially, our rate of, of a certainty is equal to what you're seeing on a ratio basis uh, with uh, uh, the US rates. And I expect excellent and similar, uh, similar levels of control. So we did, we've done a lot of evaluations and it's great that we're able to have higher rates in the US. The higher rates means you're gonna get a more uh, robust control, but it, quite frankly, Heritage WG is given excellent control at the low rate on a 14 day interval. And we're seeing this under some levels of gray leaf spot where the, uh, almost 100% of the plot is obliterated under some natural, uh, infestations. Previously, we used to do, have to inoculate. We don't have to inoculate in the U.S. anymore. The, the disease is that prevalent on, on the entire eastern seaboard, seaboard. So in 2010, that's when we started our first salatinol uh, trial with gray leaf spot. And, 
And that 75 gram active ingredient rate was a target rate that we had for selatinol. And we compared it to Heritage TL, which is uh, our liquid formulation of Heritage. And it was showing that the uh, selatinol was much more effective than even the Heritage TL. So you have a selatinol product that I think is by far one of, the, one of the best materials I've seen come out of the market for this particular disease. And we have a lot of SDHI fungicides in, in the US. And this is one of the, this is probably one of the only ones that has consistent activity on this disease. The CERNED rates looking at Rutgers University in 2020. So this was seeded this past summer, June 15th. And uh, uh, so it's a new stand. And the first uh, application was made July 16th. So that's only a month later. So uh, by July 28th, we had in the untreated areas in a natural infestation, 50% disease in the untreated went up to 100% disease and maintained a great, greater than 90% disease all the way through October and the first frost. This was a, uh, ap this is what you expect with a, a certainty under a newly seeded area. You're not going to get 100% control. Your uh, 70 to uh, 65 to 70% control is all you could expect if the grass is that young when you see that infestation. However, when you go to a mature, but the difference is very important. The uh, disease in untreated, and this is a picture that was taken in late July, and you see a certainty is maintaining under that situation. Heritage is starting to see symptoms, but the bottom line is a certainty is probably at the end of the study was the top performing uh, fungicide in that severe trial. Dr. Clark in his trial says if you get 25 to 30 percent, uh, no more than that disease in your plots by the end of the study, you have an excellent product. And we, down here at the end, we actually had 100 percent control, and the grass grew back into a great situation. These are multiple applications through the season too. You just have to keep that in mind. That's how we evaluate these products in Maryland. Uh, it was a June 15th in initiation of the, of the uh, trial. It's a mature stand. We see the disease uh, in percent is a lot less because it's a mature stand, but it's not as, uh, as prone to the disease. This is what I consider to be a normal field type of infestation. We might get 15 to 30 percent disease uh, if, the, if it's uh, not treated with a fungicide. But uh, a, a certainty at that one ounce rate that we have in the US, we only have one rate, and that's a, uh, it's great to know you can't screw it up, hopefully. But the key is we saw that uh, by July, uh, July 13th, they had 2% disease, and it went down to zero and uh, maintained excellent control through the fall. So I have 100% confidence in a certainty being able to provide, and I'm sure you'll be able to look at some of the data that we have in the US to help get a label for gray leaf spot for the UK. However, I don't want to confuse this with Dreschlera leaf spot. Dreschlera is a disease that, uh, that will affect perennial ryegrass and uh, symptoms look an awful lot alike. And the pathogen is always uh, active, except when the soil is it's frozen, so it'll happen in the spring all the way through the fall. And I've seen people confuse this with gray leaf spot, but the symptoms are a lot less. Yes, you get these lesions with the yellow halos, and yes, we know that they will die back from the tip, but the die back from the tip, the tip will not be twisted. It'll just be a simple die back. And when we test these trials, this is a curative trial. Uh, this past summer at uh, Rutgers University. And we see that the CERNI was applied, and this is when it was applied, May 7th. And it, yeah, you, uh, seven days later it went up, but it continually went down and it was a uh, fabulous control equal to Heritage, which is our uh, gold standard for uh, leaf spot control. And even Medallion was showing excellent control over a period of time.
Let's change uh, topics to brown patch. And the reason why I, uh, they wanted to talk about gray leaf spot and brown patch at the same time is these diseases happen at the same time. And I can tell you this is the, we were looking at Rhizoctonia solani. We do all of our trials uh, on, uh, on colonial bent grass mowed at fairway height. So it's gonna be at the half inch height. If we use that particular species because it, it, it's very prone to brown patch. And I, I've never seen a, a trial fail using that uh, pathogen, but I have done trials earlier on lawn care looking for the rye grass and other fescues, this grass is very susceptible to uh, rhizoctonia. So it occurs summer and fall. Uh, we get uh, brown patch happen in July all the way into September. A year ago with the uh, con weather conditions, we had it going in October, not this year. We, uh, we had more moderate conditions in 2020. But the conditions favoring this disease would be number one, night temperatures greater than 17 degrees C. So the whole idea is temperatures are a very important thing to monitor. If you have temperatures going down at night below 17, likelihood of a, a rhizoctonia or any brown patch uh, manifesting itself, it will be very low. High humidity, extended leaf wetness, just like gray leaf spot, you need leaf wetness. Uh, one person wrote years ago, uh, one professor uh, in his book wrote, you needed to have leaf wetness of 14 hours. Not, uh, and he said that it won't happen before that, but I guarantee it will happen before that if the temperatures are high enough. But uh, the bottom line is you need extended leaf wetnesses. And it used to be people would water and this goes back in my early days, uh, they would water their, their, their turf right uh, at the end of the day because they wanted to put some water on, the, on, on the, a dry area. And they'd have brown patch in the morning because they had so much leaf whiteness. It can be severe in both uh, shade or sun. So where I see gray leaf spot, again, it'll happen in the same type of areas. But lack of air movement will include the blighting as does with a gray leaf spot. So again, goes right down the same line as gray leaf spot. Infection severity is greater under grasses grown under high nitrogen fertilization. So during this summer, you wanna either use slow release nitrogen sources or back off on the nitrogen rate. Symptoms, actually this is my home lawn. This is, I was treating it with a a herbicide to control the nuts edge. And uh, you can see the beautiful pattern of uh, on my perennial ryegrass of, uh, of the gray leaf spot. So the initial symptoms are circular, blighted areas of grass with a diameter of a few inches to several feet. Re you know, typically on lower mode turf, that is a perfect ring that you can see. Oftentimes you would never see the ring like I do on this uh, two inch high, uh, uh, from the right grass on my lawn. The edges of the patch will exhibit a blue, gray, uh, gray or black smoke ring. And each individual lab, uh, uh, blade will appear as a small dull tan lesion and progress to a brown dried out appearance. Management tips. Uh, this is a picture from this summer at Rutgers University showing an excellent picture of a brown, uh, brown patch on colonial bent grass. This is what we mean by perfect ground symptoms and going from small, medium to quite coalesced to large. You, I, in my recommendations and our recommendations is Syngenta use slow release nitrogen sources during the periods of infection. Avoid uh, medium to uh, high nitrogen levels during the midsummer. Mowing when disease is active, do not mow when the canopy, always mow when the canopy is dry and remove, uh, remove clippings. And in this case, you want to avoid the higher mowing heights, just like you would with the, uh, the uh, gray leaf spot, because it's less prone to activity, especially on perennial ryegrass. Prove your drainage, irrigate at dawn, and minimize that leaf wetness. 
Same three active ingredients are labeled for a brown patch in the United States. So we have same tip recommendations on preventive and curative applications. And when we look at uh, this disease, this is where we've done trials of 150 grams of heritage of uh, active ingredient per hectare of heritage, providing outstanding control of, uh, of brown patch. So you have three products that are excellent for the control of brown patch. This just happens to be uh, a Cernity right here, the Cernity at one ounce, uh, applied either on a 14 to 28 day basis at 75 grams active ingredient. Uh, we've done three applications and two applications uh, based on a certain period of time. In the US, we'll be able to use up to four applications of a Cernity a year. And when we talk about resistance management, I'm not worried about resistance on brown patch, but I definitely am worried about resistance on gray leaf spots. So we want to maintain a minimal amount of uh, SDHI applications on a particular site. But this is fabulous control of uh, brown patch. And when you look at the, 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 the disease, the level of control, so you can extend the, uh, the uh, interval with a certainty at this particular rate and expect to get excellent brown patch control. With Heritage Max, it's one of those uh, uh, products that uh, Heritage, when it came out in uh, 1998, I think, 99, uh, was the best rhizoctonia brown patch material on the market. And it still is. A certainty has given a, a run first money. And we're seeing that in the same trial this year, looking at the rates, it provided excellent control under the same adverse conditions. I want to end here with this particular slide. Well, I'm not part of pointing to one more, but developing a plant protection program, and this goes to a lot of what Glenn said, is important for perennial ryegrass. You want to make sure you have the best knowledge of what disease happens on your site. Target those applications based on your historical data. Monitoring weather is going to be your friend and be ready to adapt your programs to unusual weather conditions. Where I've seen people fail in programs is when they're unwilling to adapt because sometimes weather will out, outweigh any fungicide application you make. And it's, it's just too much pressure for a, an extended interval, for example. I always tell people to map out their fungicide program, alternate fungicide chemistries. For a gray leaf spot, never exceed 21 day spray interval. In fact, I prefer at a 14 day spray interval. When you look at all the trial data over the last 20 years, you'll always get break with 21 days. You can get better control with a 14 day. Shorten your spray intervals always when conditions are, 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 are disease are, uh, is favorable for disease development. That's just common sense. If uh, you don't want to challenge a fungicide on the last three days of a 21 day interval with heavy disease pressure. Well, we know that early curative applications will likely re result in uh, some plant death. The key is to maintain fungicide applications on a 14 day interval and it will come back to a, uh, to a point where it would be good for uh, uh, control. With that, I'm, I'm at my uh, ending point right here. So what I'm gonna do is uh, in, in you, this part of it. That was really, really interesting. I've got to say, some terrific advice in there as well. You know, we sort of asked you to sort of talk about your experiences with sort of Grey leaf spot and brown patch because we are worried, you know, and it's kind of like, you know, we've seen instances sort of happening, but we, you know, uh, probably like everywhere, we're sort of running into sort of more extreme weather conditions. Um, but um, actually, it, it seems that grey leaf spot is not necessarily due to extreme weather conditions. It may be more to do with the extreme nature of the kind of management of the turf. And, well, you got to uh, have the host, right? You got to have the host. And number one, you have the host. You got put in the right rest. Yeah. You got you had weather conditions this year in London 
that were conducive for the disease, but you also have to have the pest. Where did that come from? Yeah. Well, we're not I see that I see that coming from the south. And yeah. the wind or trade winds that come north will bring this spore up. And once yeah. they get embedded in the turf, they'll stay there. Yeah, and that's what's and that's kind of what's happening. It was interesting to to hear that sort of your epidemic kind of traveled north was we're getting that, you know, through from south, southern Europe through up through France, there's increasing levels of reports of the sort of disease traveling north. And then all of a sudden we get an outbreak in London. And and you know, you know, we're dealing with sort of young stands. We're dealing with probably quite high nitrogen inputs and sort of leaf moisture as a matter of kind of routine. And and so, you know, we are at risk for some of these kind of serious outbreaks occurring, but it's really good to hear that actually, you know, with good integrated strategies, but also the fungicide portfolio that Syngenta have, you know, we have all the tools available to us to um, to be able to deal with this in a kind of really effective way. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, uh, people have learned to back off on nitrogen a little bit. <laughs> Some people just can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah I know. Right. But they, you know, you're sure. trying to grow a new grass and needs to have nitrogen to grow. Yeah. So you're at a crux, right? So, yeah, these guys have such quick turnaround times that there's an element of forcing going on, you know, and that's that's just. It's not bad practice, it's just what's needed to get from, from the concert at the end of the season to the start yeah, of the next if, yeah. if it were me on a sports fields, uh, these uh, stadiums, and you have a, have an overseeding application going down with new grad, I would put heritage down first. And mm -hmm. I, I, that way, it give it a protection from the seed germination, then rotate to a certainty. Because quite frankly, that, window of the first 45 days of that seedling growth even the first seven is important with perennial ryegrass uh is, is critical and so you yeah. want to make sure you've got that protection yeah and for the first time we're sort of building those programs specifically sort of you know with this in mind you know we're trying to be preemptive you know cultivar selection being really important and all this right stuff. So, i tell you what our, all of our uh, great leaf spot programs are really initiated probably in mid July uh, because disease hasn't really come on yet, but we want to make sure it's prevented. So yeah. uh, we typically will target our applications and we'll use heritage, we'll use, uh, we'll use uh, Cernity. We, we actually have other, fortunately, we have other products that you may not have that allow us to do that. Uh, so we have Dacanil, for example, which is probably one of the best products. It, it, uh, we take mix Dacanil with everything for great leaf spots. It is the bee's knees. I know. I'm You're getting it. jealous now, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, look, Mike, thank you so much. I'm a little bit conscious of time. Um, okay. I think I, I think we've kind of if if the other speakers would like to sort of come in and just kind of almost like wave goodbye. I mean, I'd just like to summarise before we do anything. You know, it seems that we've got a really terrific new formulation going on. And it's interesting to hear Mike talk about Acernity because he's got experience with it and and kind of views it as very much a very strong member of the sort of portfolio and sort of almost like an essential sort of ingredient of them. But it seems to be like a really, from what Glenn was saying, really balanced, almost like formulation with these complementary active ingredients that have their sort of sort of matched movement and systemicity, but also some sort of outside the plant activity very broad spectrum, excellent levels of control, even when compared to industry standards, extremely safe, and also fits in within the rotations really, really nicely. And so it, for me, it kind of like, it's just such a welcome addition to the portfolio. So, I mean, that's what I've come out of this with. So, so first of all, can I thank can I thank sort of Dan first of all and Glenn and Mike especially for joining us and I'd love to hear you speak again Mike you're now on the speaker list because uh, I think we could do well to listen to you. I remember traveling with Simon Barnaby years ago so yeah 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 well he may be on you never know um, but thank you so much for that also thanks to everyone for joining as well we have videoed this so you know if you've got members in your in your team or you want to kind of re review the information or manage or, you know how to 
duck out. We will forward information on that. We have basis points for, for those who require the sort of, um, you know, those kind of um, CPD accreditation uh, points, which I know a number of the groundsmen do as well as the sort of industry representatives. Um, but I just think that we should leave it at that. I think it's been absolutely terrific. I hope all the sort of, um, sort of end users are sort of, um, excited now that they've got a really good addition to their fungicide portfolio and, and kind of know better how to fit it within their sort of management program so thanks a lot guys thanks for everyone for for showing up and uh, we'll catch up with you next time okay all the best